Praise the Lord. It is a joy to be in the house of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, in the last several weeks, we've been covering the series uh, from the Epistle of James called The Doers of the Word. And we're still camped out in chapter 1, and uh, I'll be reading verses 1 through 18 today. And the title of my message is Double-Mindedness versus Steadfastness. Double-Mindedness versus Steadfastness. And as I was preparing for this message uh, over the week, um, I, I'll be very transparent in saying that uh, this had, had made a very um, strong impact in my life. Um, because I was able to um, take a look at my own life and examine and find areas of double-mindedness and to repent from that. And especially as I am standing before you, I just want to, you to know that uh, this has also impacted me. And I, my prayer is that by the power of the Holy Spirit that the Word of God will become alive in each one of us today. Hallelujah. Um, let us go ahead and read verses 1 through 18 this morning, and then we'll pray. James chapter 1, 1 through 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you, do, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all, the, all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, without no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and let the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with his scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then when desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it, has, it is fully grown, brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift, every good gift and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change of his own. He will be brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God. The word of God that is like a mirror for us, that can pierce through our souls. So, Lord, today morning, God, I entrust myself to your word, O oh Lord, and I pray that the power of the word would do its work, O oh Lord. I pray the Holy Spirit that you would engage with every heart this morning, let every heart be open to receive from you directly, O oh Lord God. I pray that the, the words that you have given me, O oh God, will just be supplementary, O oh God, just to guide, Lord, to the real person that needs to be exalted here today, and which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will magnify Jesus today morning. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. So without further ado, uh, let, let us go ahead and jump right in and uh, go through some of these verses. I, I will start with uh, double-mindedness. Uh, last week, if you are here, you heard kind of a definition of double-mindedness. It, it literally means uh, two persons, or two minds, exa excuse me, two minds. And so this is a person that ha has two sets of priorities, two sets of uh, um, 
of values. They, they tried to be uh, have their foot in two different boats. Uh, this is the double-minded man that we um, see highlighted in these verses. Starting with verse 6. Uh, today, so today I'm going to be going through 1 through 18, highlighting verses. So if you look through your Bible, it's the easiest. Uh, that way uh, you won't have to worry about what's on the screen, what's not on the screen. In verse 6 we see the double-minded man is a person who doubts. Now, uh, there's a lot said about doubting. Doubting, I think, um, being having struggling with doubt is not a sin. Um, having doubts is not sinful, but there is a, a, a state of being doubtful that that if you are in a constant state of being in doubt, that is an indication of 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 something going on in your heart of not understanding and not having the full revelation of Christ dwelling in you. Um, every doubt that comes in our heart, some, sometimes we have to just ignore it, right? There's some doubts like that. And there are some earth-shaking doubts in our soul that sometimes that comes that we have to address. Those things have to address as they come. Some of it is there to shake our faith. Some of it is from, from uh, Satan. Some of it is from just things that we hear from the world that just settles in our soul and it grows and grows. But we need to recognize that when doubt comes, when, the, when the, the kind of doubt that comes that shakes us to the core and makes us question the gospel, that, those are the kind of doubts that we need to treat right away. Um, so the double-minded person is a person that is in this state of doubt. And then it goes on to describe uh, in the same verse that, that this person is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That there's no consistency, there is no sense of focus that there, there just seems to be uh, a day to day you know depending on what is um, what they feel like in, in the day is how they how, what their convictions are right this is uh, and so we see this kind of uh, highlighted the same phrase Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 14 he says that so that we may no longer be ch- like children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by the craftiness and deceitful schemes. This is a person, the person that is tossed by the winds and the waves of the sea. Uh, this person who doubts is someone that just is, you know, if somebody comes in and speaks one Sunday, they, they're they all about what they have to do. And then somebody else comes the next Sunday and speaks, they're all about what they are saying. And there's just there's no consistency there's no building upon uh, this faith to make that faith their own, but instead they're they're being swayed by what one one person says or what another person says, and there's just simply no consistency or or growth from one uh, day to the next. Uh, verse seven, we see that this person is unstable in all their ways. Verse seven says, "For that person must not suppose." Uh, verse 7 and 8, uh, that person is not supposed that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all their ways. Now, uh, verse 9 through 11, when you read in verse 9 through 11, it makes it seem like uh, that James is now going into some other topic. But, um, you know, James does go, he, his style is more of a, co- you know, stream of consciousness. You know, he, he jumps from one thing to the other and comes back to it. That and When you read the book of James, you'll see that. Uh, but 9 through 11, we see uh, James saying that the lowly brother boasts in his exaltation, let the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away, and so on. What, what there that we see is, and I, I'm tying it to double-mindedness, is that a double-minded person is not content in, in what they have. And, and, and in that person, so this will be a person, if they, they're lacking or poor, they're in a constant state of victimhood. They're in a constant state of, I don't have anything. I, I you know, I'm poor. Compared to my siblings, I'm poor. Uh, I'm always, you know, this mentality of just victimhood and, and, and always talking down to self. Uh, but James is encouraging the people here that let the lowly brother boast in exaltation. In the sense, not that we go around talking about it. It's more like, recognize the areas where God is blessing you. You know, recognize that. that be content in that. That there will be times where the lo- the those who are the lowliest of low are being blessed. Have an eye towards what God is doing in your life. And then, then the rich, on the other hand, uh, James is saying, 
um, that, um, that the rich in his humiliation. Now, when the rich, uh, and I consider all of us here rich in this country, uh, believe it or not, whatever your income level is, we're probably in the top one to two percent of all the world's pop, you know, in the, in the, the wealth of the world. Um, you know, so just say, you know, the, so when our income goes down, we have a tendency of thinking that, uh, that, uh, something bad is happening. But it, James is saying here that, um, boast in your humiliation. Boast when that, you know, when that income goes down. In the sense of, again, being content in those ebb and flows of life where, where, you know, um, you may have been blessed for a season, may your income is increasing for a season, and now you're facing a situation where uh, there is, um, there's maybe not much growth. Uh, you, you're, you're sensing, you're thinking that it's because um, um, there's something going on in your life or, or, or Satan is taking away things from you. But again, uh, James is encouraging people here and the people he's writing to that, you know, boast in that humiliation. Because it's a practice for you and I to know that in our riches, that this is temporal. That whatever riches that God has given us, it, it's for only a season. And everything that we, we are, are, um, are uh, collecting and, 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 and uh, keeping store can all in one second go away. Next, um, James, um, to go, let's just look at verse 14. It says here that um, talks about temptation. Um, I, you, you might not think that has anything to do with double-mindedness, but when you uh, also cross-reference that this uh, section there about temptation, where you know, James says, "By each, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, and when the desire, when it's conceived, birth, gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, brings forth death." This is a person, a double-minded person, is trying to keep. Um, keep sin in their life while trying to follow Christ at the same time, um, and and this this indica- this is kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, addressed a little more clearly in James chapter four verse eight, um, it, and it was shown on the screen. James chapter four verse eight says that, in, at the end of that verse, it says, "Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Purify your hearts, you double-minded." So there's a heart issue at hand when we are double-minded that. In the pursuit of pleasure, in the pursuit of sin, while giving uh, uh, giving yourself up for all the temptations that come left and right, James is giving this exhortation. And before that, that verse is right to draw near to God, to cleanse your hearts, your sinners, purify your hearts. You're double-minded. The same word, double-minded, is used there. It, it is a it is a correction. It is a exhortation for us to repent from our wicked ways. Uh, when we look at um, verse 16 also, um, James says, chapter 1, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. So being, being double-minded is a, being in a state of being deceived. Um, and when, you know, as I was studying, in, you, know, there's, you can kind of see a cross-reference of this in Second Corinthians 11.3. Uh, Paul talks about, um, he tells, he shares his heart, he says, he says, uh, but I'm afraid that as serpent deceived E by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And before that verse, in verse 2, he says that, I feel this divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So, you know, a double-minded person is someone who has multiple husbands in their life. They, they're married to multiple things. They, they, they have their soul tied to a lot of different things. But, you know, as Paul is, uh, is exhorting that I betrothed you to one husband. I, I, their purpose is to have a single focus to the single husband, Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself be deceived like the serpent deceived E through his cunningness. But have a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So in all these things, verse 7 we read, uh, when you go back to chapter 1, it says, that person, this double-minded person, should not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Why is that? It's because your, your desires have been tainted through your double-mindedness. That's why when we pray, you know, there, there are a lot of things we pray for. There's a lot, there, there are a lot of good things that we pray for that God says wait or God says no. But there are things that we pray for that is simply not of the Lord. 
And, and to be double-minded, we need to be careful in, in, in praying for things when we are double-minded because we're going to be, our, our, in, our interest, our, our desires, uh, our motivations will be tainted by the other side of things. You know, uh, so, um, that's, that, so that's what we see here in the verses uh, 1 through 18, the double-minded person. Um, so, you know, a, a double-minded person not only affects themselves, but imagine a, a family of double-minded people. That, aff- that makes that family a double-minded family. Imagine a church of double-minded people. I mean, that, that infects the church. It's like a plague that infects the church of double-minded people and makes it a double-minded church. Unfortunately, we see, we're, we see fruits of this, whether it's in our life or other people's lives. Of, of this double-mindedness creeping into um, families and churches where all their motivations is no longer about Christ, no longer about growing in Christ, but about other things. What do, what, you know, what do the Jones think? You know, what, what, what do the people across the street think? What do people in church think? And, uh, and you're getting yourself in debt. You're getting yourself in, in a lot of things that, that have nothing to do with Christ. And it's all because you are trying to be in both boats at the same time. Now, as we go, move forward, um, my time is already gone so i have to be very fast here um it comes from uh um, the same passages i'm going to be very fast here uh verses three now what does james talk about being steadfast right james says that verse three for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness testing of your faith produces steadfastness there's a there's a quote that says uh, a faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. A faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. Verse 5, we see, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. But if we look at the verse before that, in verse 4, it says that, that you let your steadfastness have its full effect so that you will be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. So it says lacking in nothing, and then verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom. So a person that is... Walking in steadfastness is, is also walking in the fullness of wisdom. Like wisdom, and we heard it uh, the first week about wisdom being in the person of Christ uh, and wisdom being applied in, in our trials and temptations and tests. Um, verse 12, uh, sorry for going fast. I, I really wanted to make some of these points. Uh, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. It's just, and this kind of ties to the, the, um, um, the Beatitudes. And when Jesus uh, shares from the Sermon on the Mount, you know, when we see the word blessed here, just know that the James is tying a lot of things to the teachings of Christ. Um, and, and so there's a, a state of blessedness when we are walking steadfast and steadfast and when we are walking uh, in, in enduring through trials in our life. Verse 18, uh, it says, um, and this ties a little bit to another scripture portion. That's why I want to highlight it. It says here that, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That this is the intent of God, that those who are steadfast until the end become a first fruits of the, of creation. That, that, that we are saved for the purpose to produce fruit. And Jesus says the same thing uh, uh, related to this in Luke chapter 8, verse 15. He says that uh, the, for those who have the, the, the word planted in good soil, he says that they, they are those hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, bearing fruit with patience. And this word patience is actually the same word as being steadfast and endurance that James uses. So that, that this is the intent to, to bear good fruit to, you know, with, with endurance. So endurance produces fruit in our life. Now, when we jump back to James chapter, in verse 4, it says that steadfastness have its full effect. That there, there, there is a, there's a gradual increase in this, that, that the intent is that, that we will grow in the perfection of Christ, that we will grow, grow in the full stature of Christ, that, that we, will, um, we will grow in wholeness, not that we will be perfect overnight. But the intent is that, that day by day that we walk and we become like Jesus. Uh, and, and then we will once and for all be glorified and we will have the body that he has. We will see him just as he is. And that is our goal is in this life, through the trials of our life, to endure and, and be steadfast and grow, grow day to day through these trials. Hallelujah. Verse 1 says that for all these reasons I just said, 
What does James say? Uh, verse, uh, verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers. Count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds. Let me just say about trials. You know, there, there are tr- three types of trials. There, you know, uh, there, there's a self-inflicted trial. Like if you run past a red light and get a ticket, that, that is self-inflicted. You know, that, that you cannot blame the devil for that one. Um, you know, then there's the kind of trial that is for discipline. The purpose of discipline is a, is a teaching purpose. Um, we are being discipled through trials. It is, it is only for those who love God. That those who, who love God are disciplined through trials. And so it might affect areas that, are not, that might not be directly proportional to... You might be doing something right in one area. And that might be the area where God allows a trial to happen. And it is in, in, the purpose of that is so that... The areas where you have put a blind eye to it can be addressed. He touches sometimes our strength so that our weakness can even be more amplified in that trial. So that God will teach us through that. That God teaches us through trials. Lastly, there is a kind of trial that is not of our fault. Um, the righteous suffering, the like the you know, then this is where we get to experience being in fellowship with the sufferings of Christ. Um, Joseph went through this. Joseph, for saying no to sin, was put in jail. Uh, uh, you know, Daniel for uh, praying, uh, he was uh, he was put in the lion's den. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. You know, there are long list of people that for doing the right thing, they were they were put in trial for that very same thing. But so that in all these things, we are asked to count it all joy. So as the worship team comes up, there is a verse uh, uh, that we all know that has all these elements uh, tied together. It's not, in the, it's not in James, but it's in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. Let us run with endurance. The same word, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the, uh, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So in, this, in these two verses, we see joy, we see this endurance, we see faith. There's another verse in Isaiah 53, 11 that says, talking about Jesus, out of his anguish, he shall see and be satisfied. That in the anguish of our trials, God gives us a vision. And in our case, he gives us a vision of himself. When Jesus went to the cross, he saw the joy that set before him of, of thousands and millions of people being redeemed out of, the, out of the slavery and the clutches of sin, joining with him as a bride. That him being exalted Uh, by the Father His name being above every other name so we're we're called to have a joyous satisfaction in Jesus even in the midst of the most difficult challenges in our life because the outcome if we endure is the salvation of our souls hallelujah there are many things that I wanted to say but I, I will wrap it up here um Let us take a moment of time just to consider Jesus this morning. The steadfastness of Jesus is a model for us. He obeyed the Father in everything. He obeyed Him even until death, the death on the cross. He left the glories of heaven. He said, my food is to do the will of my Father. He obeyed Him 100%. Yet he went through many trials. He, uh, Hebrew says that he, he made loud cries and tears, crying to him who can only hear him. And the father heard that prayer. I imagine the prayers at that moment was, Father, Father, help me to endure the cross. Help me to, to, to be resurrected and, and to see your glory again. Even when I go through that fiery trouble in the cross, help me to do your will even in that moment. There's so many things that we, if we just meditate upon the life of Christ, that we will find that joy.
will find that satisfaction in Jesus alone. So I pray, Lord, this morning that God, that as there's a gathered, uh, a gathered uh, people here of all different circumstances, all different experiences. There are people here with scars, their physical scars, with mental scars, with emotional scars. Oh God, with a lot of, a uh, lot of history. Oh God, of abuse, a lot of history of Lord, uh, just all kinds of misfortune and, and difficult challenges. Lord, I just pray, God, that whether it's in the past, present, or future, I pray, oh Lord, that you will help. Church, all the members of this church, oh God, endure till the end. Help us to see each other, oh God, together with you in heaven, oh Lord. I pray that none, oh God, will be lost. I pray that, Lord, that Jesus, as you prayed for Peter, that his faith will not fail. I, I, we know, oh God, and we trust that, Lord, that you're interceding for us, that our faith will not fail. Even when Satan sh- sift us like wheat, I pray, oh Lord, that that we will trust in your in your intercession for us that our faith will not fail oh god we pray oh god for those who are, who are going through seasons of doubt seasons of struggle i pray for an encouragement of the holy spirit oh god to change them oh god so that they will be lord servants that will endure till the end oh lord we give you all the praise glory and honor oh god in jesus name